mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all, when we all get to heaven, what a day, what a day that will rejoicing that will be. When we all, when we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the shout of victory. We're going to have literally a sermon on or a sermon about nothing. Now, not that we're going to talk about nothing and not that we're not going to look at something, but it's going to involve nothing. Now, if you figure that out before we get going, you know the end. And what we're going to do when we get finished, we're going to know nothing. And you'll understand as we go through tonight why we're having a sermon on nothing We're going to look at some passages throughout the Scripture, and if you'll go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 1, I want us to begin here. That's going to be some passages that deal with the word nothing. I find it interesting to look at words, and tonight the word nothing stands to us. The first point we're going to look at tonight is God created the world from nothing. God created the world from nothing. It's very practical for us as we study God's Word to know what God has been doing. And one of the things that we are interested greatly in is the world that we live in. We live here. Many of you own land here. Kelly and I are privileged to own a half acre of land. That is our half acre of nothing. God created this world and all things that are in it in the concept with nothing. Go with me to Genesis chapter 3, and I want you to notice verse 1, and then we'll slide on down to Hebrews chapter 11 and look at verse 3. Uh, Genesis 1, 1 says this, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. That's a passage we know. That's a passage that I love to reference quite a bit because it teaches us something. In the beginning, number one, there was God. God should always be in our minds the one thing that has always been consistent The one thing that's always been existent, but not only that, he is the one thing that actually has been creating. We make something and we get proud of ourselves. Look at what I've created. Well, all we've really accomplished was arranging things that God has created, like dirt or wood, or maybe we take water. And we arrange these different elements, whatever they may be, and we get the bright idea that we've created something. God is the one who created the world from nothing. And if you go into Hebrews chapter 11, this is where we're going to start to see this play out. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3 says this, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. I want you to notice this very clearly. And it goes back to Genesis chapter 1. God made or created the world from nothing. In the same thing you find in Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3, you find happening here in Hebrews chapter 11, that chapter of faith. We see in verse 3 here, through faith, through the system of faith, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. God spoke this world into existence. He used words. He did not use elements as we would use, but he said, let there be light. Guess what happened? There was light. And on down through the creation, we see God was creating things by speaking out, not by creating things by the way we would imagine creating things, by gathering materials and doing this and doing that. God created the world from nothing. See, that's a concept that we have to really wrap our minds around. God was able to do amazing things. Go ahead and turn to Psalm 33. If you can't find it in the Psalms, you're going to be struggling to find it. In the book of Psalms, many of these particular books talk about the creation of this world. And Psalm 33, verses 8 and 9, affirm to us what we're looking at here. The psalmist says in verse 8, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. 
there is a very specific reason why we're starting here. We need to understand as a foundational principle for us that God was able to speak and it was done. God was able to speak and it was done. And look at the language that he uses here. And I want you to center in on verse 8 because here is why we wanted to look at this. Let all the earth respect the Lord. We're a part of all the earth, aren't we? Now, I know this was written many years ago, but the same is true as it was then. Those who inhabit the earth, they should fear or respect God. And we get to see the scenes of happening in verse 8. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Now, this word awe here is the word originally where we received the word awesome. Now, we have just dumbed down the word awesome because now when anything is neat, what do we say? That was awesome. And there are several of us that use that word. I'm guilty of using that word quite a bit. But this is a word that means when you look back at everything that's happened, you're left standing in amazement of what's happening. So look at what he's saying in verse 8 here. The psalmist writes, Let all the inhabitants of the world look back at everything that's been done and stand in amazement of God because he is the one. You look at verse 9. For he spoke and it was done. For he commanded and it stood fast. God created the world with nothing. So we move into our next nothing passage. And this particular nothing area deals with us, but it also deals with Christ. We can do nothing without Christ. Go to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. And also our study tonight is very much a book chapter verse study. From time to time, I like to go into a particular sermon where we just go from passage to passage and we just look at what God's Word has to say. Here we are tonight. We can do nothing without Christ. John chapter 15, verse 5 says this, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Now understand what he's saying. We can live. That's very possible. Every person in this room right now, thankfully, you are living. The heart is beating. The lungs are breathing. The eyes are looking. The ears are listening. And the brain, while the brain is thinking, you're alive. And you're here tonight. But you know, living in this world, living even in the world of which this particular passage was written, we really can do nothing without Christ. We get high-minded of ourselves sometimes, and we think we can do it. We think we can stand above God. We think we can stand without God. But here is Christ saying, I'm the vine, and you're the branches. If you want to be connected to the Heavenly Father, you must go through me, is what he's saying. And without me, you can do nothing. Salvation is a topic that is wonderful to discuss because it's a topic that means sin, oh, they're no more. Problems, why they are dissolved. Issues, why they're nothing to worry about because eternity is here. Salvation means an eternity with God exists. But I'm here to tell us tonight the same thing in John 15, verse 5. Without Christ... If we stand separate and apart and away from Christ, we can do nothing. Now, we may be going through certain motions. The eyes may be looking. The ears may be listening. But we're not living. Not as God would have us to do. And that brings us back to Matthew chapter 12. Go back to Matthew chapter 12. Just turn a little bit back there. And let's see what's being said in this particular section. Matthew chapter 12. If you go all the way down in the words of Jesus in verse 30. Matthew chapter 12, verse 30. This is what we read here. He that is not with me is against me. He that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. The context of what's happening here, if you look back in verse 25, is the context that says every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. In other words, if you're going to be a part of Christ... 
You're going to have to live after Christ. If you're going to be a part of his kingdom, you must work in his kingdom. You must be active. In other words, it's back to our statement on the screen, we can do nothing without Christ. If I want to be a Christian, I must be involved in Christ. And we read this particular phrase. This really puts it right up in our faces, verse 30. He that's not with me, in other words, he that is not doing as I have commanded, is against me. We stand in this very moment of life. I know you're sitting right now, but we stand in this moment of life and we're making a decision. I will either be with Christ or I will not. This world has its allurements. This world has the things that we think we need. And we've got to decide who we're going to be with, what we're going to do, and how we're going to do it. The writer of the Galatians letter wrote it this in Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 27. We read this right here. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Listen to verse 26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Verse 27 tells us how to get into Christ. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now there's a principle that we understand. Every person in this room, thankfully tonight, put on their clothes. Now let's use this wild, outlandish illustration to understand something. Before I got ready to come over here today, I put on my pants. Had a pair of shorts on. So I put my pants on. I am in my pants. If I'm going to be in Christ, what do I have to do? I have to get in him. Now, I can't put my pants on if they're laying on this chair behind me, can I? That's not going to work. If I left them on the spare bedroom bed, would I have my pants on right now? I have a good feeling I wouldn't be standing right here, would you? Now, we understand that about some clothing, don't we? Now, apply this to Christ. Look at verse 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ... Buried in waters of baptism into Christ, have put on what? Christ. We can do nothing without Christ. That's why salvation is so sweet to discuss. I need to understand the Savior. I need to understand what it means to be in Him. And that means being buried to the old man, as the book of Corinthians teaches us, to be risen up or to be risen a new man. There's a change that happens when one becomes a child of God. Going from a worldly standpoint to an eternal standpoint. But in this concept, context, we can do nothing without Christ. Which leads us to the things we do. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now we know 1 Corinthians chapter 13, just off on the, on the, the top of our minds, is the love book. We can see this as we look at this particular section. We look at verse 2. We see the word charity or love have happening here. We see verse 4. Charity or love suffers long. And we like to talk about that passage. But I want to put it into its context for just a minute. It's not just a passage about love. Now, now we quote this passage quite often when we talk about love because everything in chapter 13 has everything to do with love. But let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. And let's get the context of this because our deeds that we do, the things we do in our lives, why without love, they're nothing. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 says this, Though I speak with tongues of men and angels and have not charity or love, I am become as sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. What's he saying there? If I don't have love in the things that I do, I'm just as if someone's beating on the cymbal. There's a lot of noise there. Not much else is going on. I'm like, he says in this particular section, I'm like the sounding brass. I'm like the instrument of brass. Well, there's noise coming forth, but that's it. Now add verse 2 to this. And though I have all gift of prophecy... We're getting into some of the spiritual gifts or some of the gifts of the Holy Spirit here. Get the context. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries 
if I can understand everything that was going to come to place and everything that has come to place, read what he says, and if I have all knowledge, and though I have faith so that I can remove mountains, and I have not love, listen to this phrase, I am nothing. Now read verse 3. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity or love, it profiteth me nothing. Two times the word nothing is used. It's emphatic here. And that brings us on down into verse 4 that we know so well. Charity suffereth long. It's kind. Charity envieth not. Charity bondeth not itself. It's not puffed up. It does not behave itself unseemingly. It seeks not her own. It's not easily provoked. It thinks no evil. It rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth. It beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, and endureth all things. Charity never fails. Whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, for it shall vanish away. Look at verse 9. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away with. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For well, now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as I also am known. And now abideth faith, hope, and charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. The greatest of these is love. Now let's put this in the context. It's 13 verses. What's the context? Spiritual gifts. But watch the second half of the context. They're not going to last forever. But do you know what's going to last forever? Charity. Kind-heartedness. Considerable care. We call it love. Deeds without love, why they are, verse 2. Why they are, verse 3. And what's interesting to me is the very last words of verse 2 and 3 is nothing. We can get all the characteristics of it right. But if I leave love out, I'm nothing. Deeds without love, why they're nothing. Also, as you go back into the book of Matthew, we're going to find another passage and by the description that's on the screen, I have an idea even with where it's at. You know what this is going to say, Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. A wonderful section of Jesus here. And you know the passage. Here it is. You're the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith will it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot of men. Salt. It's used for curing. It's used for prolonging concepts of life. It's used even in some concepts for medicinal purposes. Salt. It's good. But what happens when our goodness becomes nothingness? What happens when our goodness, our savor, our flavor becomes nothingness. We love to get out that little salt shaker. It sits on most likely all of our tables. We have two. We have one on the counter too. Usually we have one in the pantry or maybe in the cupboard. And we like that salt because when we dash it out, ah, there it is. What would we say if we dashed out the salt tonight on supper or tomorrow evening and it was just crunchy there was no flavor what would we say of this salt why it's good for nothing and the same is true for those who follow after Christ we should be good for something and not nothing 
He says, you're the salt of the earth. You are literally going to be the people who save the earth. You are important. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 is a passage that says, Child of God, follower of Jesus Christ, you're worth every penny. We understand that phrase. You're worth it. But, but, you may not always be. But if the salt has lost its savor, what's it good for? Why, it's to be cast out and trodden under the feet of men because that's all it's good for. It's good for nothing. Also in Matthew chapter 5, we understand the concept he's giving here in this particular section. If light cannot be seen, what is it good for? Nothing. If light is lit in a room and it's put under it's put under something that shines or takes away the light. What's it good for? He says in verse 16, and it sums it up, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We should be the type of people who flavor the lives of others. That means in the things that we do, we should be the type of people who give God the glory, who give God the credit, who understand I have to be worth something. That means in everything that I do, I must be worth it. That's why we need to go to Colossians chapter 4, verse 6. Because remember the words that are used in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. As we go over to Colossians and see one of these words appear back again. Colossians 3, verse 6 says this. Let your speech be always with grace. Now notice next. Seasoned with salt that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Well, the context of the passage is I should be willing or able or have the answers to answer every man of the things that come unto us. But I want us to center in on the idea of the passage. Let your speech always be with grace. Let your speech be what it needs to be. Let your speech be what someone doesn't deserve. Let your speech be what you do not deserve. Let it be as if when we're talking to others, as if Christ himself is speaking. God is the giver of grace, and we must be able to give it also. And here in the context, let your speech Words can do two things. They can either help or they can hurt. You choose what you salt your words with. Salt or savorless salt is good for nothing. Not only that, we're going to find this. Is this will be the last point of our particular lesson tonight. We literally will be the type of people that will carry nothing we will carry nothing out of this world. Go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6, and I want us to note verse 7. We read this, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. The language is wonderful, and it is certain. That's a word that means you can take this to the bank. This is worth it. We will take nothing out. Usually you'll hear people in this particular context use the phrase, you can't put the U-Haul behind the hearse. But I want us to see what this particular phrase is really saying. Verse 7. God provided you everything you needed while you're here. And he's going to take care of you in eternity too. This is a letter that's written to children of God. It's written to a young man named Timothy. And he was told in this particular letter... Make sure you make these people aware of everything they need to know. One of those things is you certainly brought nothing into the world and you certainly will carry nothing out. We are lovers of stuff. Some of it's useless, some of it's valuable. But we love our stuff. We know this in the culture we live. How many, many storage places do you know of? And how many of them are full? 
even to the point that the television people have picked up on this and they've decided to make a TV show about people who buy storage units when nobody wanted their junk anymore. We're a people of stuff. You go throughout your home, you move once or twice, and you'll see you're a person of stuff. Now, I'm not saying that in the negative sense, but understand everything we own, it's not ours. It belongs unto God. He's the one that gave it. He's the one that made it. And he's the one that can give us all the things we would ever want in our lives. And that brings us to Matthew chapter 6, the passage that John read for us just a moment ago so well. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 20, and we're going to add verse 21 to this. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon where? Upon the earth. Let's just take that for just a moment. The treasure that I'm storing up, where should it be? Here's what I know. Not here. Where are we at? The earth. It should be not here. Lay not, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. Have you ever had anybody steal something from you? Have you ever had something rust out? I parked my vehicle at the Nashville International Airport, and lo and behold, never would have thought this. You ever left trailer wiring on your truck? Somebody will pick it up for you. Where thieves break through and steal. Our possessions, why they may not be here very long, they may go away because thieves may break through and steal. You ever had something rust out? Rust is an interesting thing. You may not see it right on the surface, but deep in there, whatever that metal may be, it may be rusting to bits and one day it just falls apart. You didn't expect that, did you? You thought it would be around forever. Oh, lay not up for yourselves treasures on the earth. Why? Because things happen to things upon the earth. Verse 20, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, where thieves do not break through to steal. Now you add verse 21 to this. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. We certainly will not carry anything out of this world. And we certainly know where our treasure must be. It's just up to us to lay up a treasure in heaven. So there you have it. We've had a simple sermon about nothing. We knew we'd say something, and we knew there would be a lot of nothing. But really, it's about everything. It's a sermon about everything. Here's why. Many years ago, one who was called Jesus Christ left the realm that is called eternity to come to the place that he had a hand in creating to live as we live to walk as we've walked to be tempted as we've been tempted and yet he did so perfectly without sin without blemish without spot and it was prophesied he would do such and though he knew why he was come to this earth he went to a place called the cross. You also hear it referred to sometimes the place called Golgotha. And he gave up his life so that we could have something. So that we could have everything. It may be the case tonight that you're not a child of God, you're not a Christian. I want to encourage you tonight that only by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17, can you know what you need to do to have everything by hearing His Word, by believing it, putting your faith in it, by repenting, repenting of your past sins, which means change. If you steal, steal no more. If you lie, lie no more. We understand the concept of change. Confess the name of Jesus and be immersed in the water. That's happened once today. Would you like to be number two? You can tonight. And you can know as you leave this room, you don't have nothing. 
you have everything. May be the case also tonight that you've had everything at one time, and for whatever reason, you now have nothing. You don't have to leave like that. You don't have to leave this room like that. You can leave in a wonderful state, a state that's called forgiven. Children of God, why, we are tempted, just as the world is tempted. And sometimes, yes, even children of God make mistakes. There's not a person in this room that's exempt from mistakes. There's not a person in this room that's exempt from sin. Eventually, when we are accountable, we will be in sin. And the child of God is not exempt from that. If you're a child of God tonight and you realize there's sin in your life, whatever it may be, why go home with that weight? Why go home with nothing? Why not leave with everything by confessing that unto our Lord? If one has a need tonight with a need to become a child of God or needing to make their life right with the Lord, why don't you do so as together we stand and sing?